difficult and is very challenging during this COVID. It's one of the most interesting topics for me as well. So again, I welcome you for addressing today's session. Uh, over to you, Professor Vandita, to please take over. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Good afternoon to one and all present here once again. Today, we are extremely honored and privileged to welcome among us Dr. Tom Baum, Professor and Head of the Department of Work, Employment and Organization in the Strathclyde Business School, University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Dr. Baum is an authority and a specialist in the study of employment, education and training in the context of the international tourism and hospitality industry. He has over 35 years experience in vocational and higher education and specializes in workforce planning, curriculum development, program design and assessment. Dr. Baum has published 10 books and over 175 scientific papers in the context of vocational education and training. He has supervised over 35 PhD students to completion and acted as external examiner to over 50 doctorates in six countries. Dr. Baum has worked with a variety of international agencies in his area of specialization, including the World Bank, the Asia Development Bank, UNDP, UNICEF, UNWTO, COM, CAC, and the EU. Dr. Baum is currently engaged with a major grant from the Newton Fund, looking at the future of tourism employment in the smart city. We welcome you, sir, and you may kindly proceed with the session. Thank you very much, and thank you for the the, the welcomes. Um, it's one of the unintended, I suppose, the uh, the silver linings of the global pandemic that there is th th that suddenly we are provided with the opportunity to interact with, uh, with colleagues and students all over the world in a way that we we probably wouldn't have even conceived of. Um, Previously, and it's always a pleasure to uh, yeah, to meet to meet um, a range of, of new people, particularly the future of our industry, the the, the young people, our students, um, whom otherwise I wouldn't have the opportunity to, to meet unless I was um, uh, very lucky. So I'm going to try to share my screen. As I um, said earlier, I'm not an expert at Teams. I'm more familiar with um, with. Uh, now where is my, are my windows? Gosh, where 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 is? Hang, wait a minute. Let me put this up. Does this? Come? Where are we? It's visible. It's visible. It's, yeah. Is it visible? Yes. Oh, yes, okay. it's visible. That is good. OK, so now you, you, you can see my screen. Um, I have a technical problem with my computer, which means I'm going to have to manually switch the, the slides. But please bear with me. Yeah. To talk about human resource development needs in the travel and tourism sector of the future, I mean, is of course, is hugely speculative. We really, we, we don't know. We can only envisage a future. We can only um, talk about our industry in, with a few, in, in, in the future based on, um, on current information, but also where we aspire the, that future to take us. Um, for me, um, a lot of the discussion about our future um, and this is not just in, in, in the human resource field, it's in, in the wider, um, in wider society and wider lives, is flawed because it is based on trends and on data. And I'm a great believer in data, but if we only look backwards as a means of looking forwards, in a sense, we'll never move forward. And I think that's, and, and, and I, if, if anything, um, if, if our experiences of the last 20 years in, in relation to technology, for example, are anything to go by, so much has happened that none of us expected and which futurologists didn't expect. So what I'm saying really here is that in thinking about the workforce in, human, in, in the travel and tourism sector, we need to be aspirational. We need to be optimistic. 
We need to create a vision which we can then collectively, globally, if you like, work towards. OK, let me just start a little bit more. Thank you, uh, as I said, for the, for the very kind introduction to, uh, to myself. I wanted to share a picture of my my first home in India many, many years ago. And many of you will recognize this iconic building, um, not the gateway, the hotel behind it. And I was lucky enough that my first uh, my first visit to, India to be doing some work at Taj Hotels. And um, even though I was a uh, um, um, quite insignificant in many respects, they did accommodate me in some very in a very nice apartment in the Taj Mahal Hotel in Mumbai. And um, this was my introduction to India, which was um, which was which was wonderful. And I, had, I did some really interesting work over a, a period of time with uh, with Taj at the time. Um, just a little bit, a, a little bit more detail about myself. I am passionate about cricket, so I have quite a lot in common with, with I think, one or two Indians, and therefore I can't help but share this slide with you. And I hope you're not offended. Um, it's only what what we might call revenge for what happened a, a few weeks ago. I have to say, as you can see from my my grey hair, that um, I have to say that for me. Cricket is much more about these games than about the IPL and the, 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 the quick forms of cricket that have emerged in recent years. So a good test match, a, a challenging test match is says everything about me. And in a sense, thinking about the longer form of, of life, I think that's also important in terms of our discussion today, because um, one of the challenges I've confronted over the years in addressing human resource um, themes in um, in travel and tourism has been that people are looking for quick fixes. People are looking for the, the answer to the here and now problems. We can't recruit a chef. What do we do about it? And the lack of vision, both from the industry side, but also from the academy side, in looking just for short what I would call managerial operational fixes rather than trying to understand more fundamentally the the causes of those problems and trying to address them at a not only a strategic um, level but at a societal level um, is I always I've always found that to be somewhat um, um, unfortunate so where do I want this discussion um, this afternoon to go? Well, I think our starting point has to be with recognised issues in relation to work and employment in the travel and tourism industry globally. Um, things like precarious, uh, the precarious nature of the work. India has its seasonal destinations, for example, from a travel and tourism point of view. Where does employment fit into a seasonal economy, for example. Um, low pay, challenging work, overrepresentation of marginalized vulnerable groups and more. Um, I recognize that my, my, um, my, the currency of, of, of my um, views or my, my information on the specific um, Indian the travel and tourism industry is limited, so I'm speaking much more from a global point of view, but bear with me on that. The sort of other things I want to look at, um, looking at decent work in travel and tourism, the ILO's um, um, aspiration to see decent work for all as the basis of where we're going. And where does work and employment sit in um, in in the wider sustainability debate, you'll, I'm sure you'll all be familiar with, um, and I'll come to them in a minute. The um, the sustainable development goals um, established by the United Nations and employment sits there. We we can see it very clearly. Um, but my argument that in is that in travel and tourism, much of the debate is about environmental, climate-related issues. And the social pillar 
of the sustainable sustainability de uh, development debate, um, which includes employment, tends to be neglected in uh, in our industry. And I feel quite strongly about that. And then the final sort of um, end to the conversation is um, um, the, the global pandemic, work and employment in travel and tourism. Have, have, are we experiencing just short term change? And for many of us, there has been significant change. Or are we seeing a fundamental reset? And of course, we don't know this stage. Um, we may aspire that there will be some form of a, um, a fundamental reset, but who knows at this stage? And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, so I think we need to sort of recognize that the best of times, travel and tourism employment is characterized by diversity. We have such a variety of businesses operating micro, um, small and micro businesses right the way through to multinationals, to major global players like the Indian hotel companies I mentioned, uh, Taj, Oberoi, but also uh, multinationals from elsewhere. And we must remember also that um, tourism operates at a number of levels within all economies, um, within the formal economy, which most of us are familiar with, with the brand names, but even some of the smaller businesses, the informal um, economy, the street vendors in most tourism destinations in most cities who operate outside of the mainstream um, economy, and then the emerging gig and sharing economy, which many of you will be uh, familiar with, whether it's in accommodation, whether it's in uh, food delivery, whether it's in in transport. And um, so we've got a very complex issue. And so when we talk about employment, we talk about work, when we talk about human resource development, we need to bear in mind that we're not talking about a homogeneous sector. Um, I mentioned precariousness earlier, um, and, and it's an industry that's really uh, very sensitive to demand variation and market changes. I mentioned seasonality, where we see um, a very significant sort of up, um, troughs and peaks appearing in on the demand side, which then has consequences for employment on the supply side. And it's important to bear that in mind. Where I live here in Scotland, some of our tourism um, destinations in the, in the more remote um, um, highland and island areas um, operate a six, seven month um, season and, and many of the businesses close down in the winter. And what happens to employment? What happens to people's careers, people, people's livelihoods when the businesses um, can no longer sustain them? Um, it's an industry where we see a high level of transitory mobile migrant employees. I mean, that's a great plus or was until the pandemic for young people like yourselves, because it's a um, we always talk about travel and tourism as a passport to travel, to go to other countries, to go and work in um, and gain experience in different uh, situations through internships, through um, through employment. But it's also an industry which in, in my country and other um, uh, global north countries um, depends very he um, heavily on um, transitory migrant labour. If any of you have considered working in any of the Gulf states, for example, in the travel and tourism industry there in Dubai or in um, 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 or in um, uh, Oman, for example, um, very high proportion of the tourism workforce there is um, is, is from elsewhere. Look at the, the large airlines in that in, in that region, Emirates, Qatar. They depend very heavily um, on um, on um, non-national workers. The low status of work in many communities, um, tour, travel and tourism industry does have a credibility issue in many in the eyes of many people. It's a job which people take 
um, not necessarily um, in preference to some other professions. But at the same time, it is an industry in every parish. Um, it's uh, an industry which is really represented in almost every community, every village in, in every country. So it is an industry that provides employment really um, everywhere. And that is a huge benefit to it, as I mentioned, seasonality, high late levels of labor turnover in many countries. In the, um, prior to the pandemic in Hong Kong, for example, we were experiencing 80, 90 percent annual turnover in, um, in the hotel industry there. Challenging working conditions, the challenge and the question marks over automation, and that's been exacerbated, has been accelerated uh, through the pandemic in some countries. If we can replace people with machines, we have health and, and safety benefits in the pandemic context. We also have potentially a, a cheaper labour force. Um, because machines don't necessarily cost as much money long term. Um, but what does that mean for service? What does that mean for the, the experience that people, um, that people look to from, uh, from the travel and tourism industry? And as I mentioned earlier, low pay. So this really brings us to locating our discussion in the context of the STG, uh, SDGs. Uh, the 17 goals to transform our world, as the UN calls them. And the obvious one um, where uh, this discussion fits into is number eight, decent work and economic growth. And clearly um, the, the decent work influence of the ILO comes in there as well. But I've ticked a number of the other boxes there rather clumsily, and they all have something to say in this discussion um, as well, particularly at a a community level, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being are all important consequences of good quality, well-paid jobs in the travel and tourism industry. Um, quality education that you, um, you, you, you students are currently receiving in, in your university. Um, Gender equality, an area that I'm particularly interested in because of, of the real issues in travel and tourism globally in relation to gender. Um, reduced inequalities more generally, responsible consumption and production. I mean, one of my, um, my big issues really around low pay in, in this country is that, um, that in some ways, tourism workers, travel and tourism workers are paid relatively low relative to other professions because consumers are always looking for the cheapest price for their goods and services they, they, they purchased. If we as consumers were willing to pay realistic prices for our experiences in hotels, in travel, uh, wherever it is, maybe employees would be better paid. But um, that, is a, that, that is a debate which is very hard to sustain in a very competitive business environment. The problem though is when we think about sustainability, we tend to think about the sort of the green dimension, as I said, the environmental. And we have um, Green Globe certification for hotels, we have airlines, experimenting with biofuels and alternative uh, um, lower carbon uh, burning um, or creating um, flight options etc um, but we have to recognize at the same time that sustainability is not just about the environmental um, sustainability the concept of sustainability is really built on three pillars the environmental the economic and the social and the social for me as i said earlier is the neglected dimension within um, within this particular um, equation um, so we think of um, in, we think of sustainability in terms of recycling for example but um, should we also be thinking about the sustainability of the people um, of the lives 
and the communities that are affected by travel and tourism? Should we actually thinking about um, what happens to people at the end of a tourism season? Should we be thinking about the, um, the high level of burnout that people working in very intensive tour travel and tourism industry jobs experience? Should we be thinking about um, the relationship between um, between tourism and tra travel and tourism employment and the opportunities that are available to all members of host communities? So I think there's a there's a lot that, that that's going on in this area. And in thinking about the future of um, human resource employ uh, development, of employment, of work um, in our industry, um, I'm increasingly minded to think about what's, uh, and I'll come to this in a minute, sustainable human resource development, sustainable human resource management as a, a platform for which to, if you like, to envisage, to visualize the future. Of course, the people who work in, in our industry, as, as the industry is varied, so are the people who work in the industry, hugely varied, um, doing all sorts of jobs in all sorts of different um, uh, contexts. This with the exception, perhaps, of the, um, the Air India uh, cabin crew is more hospitality focused, but we could put tour guides in here, we could put adventure uh, instructors, we could put travel agents, we could put all sorts of people. We are a very, very, very broad community. And in a sense, um, one of the strengths of travel and tourism is that it does provide opportunity for people of multiple talents, of multiple interests, of multiple circumstances and conditions in terms of their lives. People who need to work very close to their, their home, people who are mobile, people who have potentially disabilities, people from minority communities. And of course, down at the bottom here, I had to include my Scotsman, um, a uh, concierge from one of our, our better hotels here in Scotland wearing his kilt. Um, I'm always very suspicious when I see um, somebody in concierge on the telephone because they're usually negotiating a deal somewhere along the line. Um, so I think we need to look, think about sustainability in, in, in tourism, in travel, work. Um, I've mentioned the, um, the, 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 the UN's 2030 agenda. The whole concept of sustainable tourism from the United Nations World Tourism Organization, tourism that takes full account of its current and future economic, social and environmental impacts, addressing the needs of visitors, the industry, the environment. And I've um, emphasized here host communities because I think that's often the neglected element. And a lot of the debate, I don't know if you follow an international debate on on the re-emergence of travel and tourism at the moment, but a lot of about uh, the debate is about over tourism, is about um, um, swamping communities in a way that affects the quality of their lives with tourism. So how do we balance the job opportunities, the economic opportunities that tourism undoubtedly brings with the needs of the wider community in which um, tourism is located. Decent work. Um, I like this definition from the ILO. Decent work sums up the aspirations of people in their working lives, it involves opportunities for work that is productive and delivers a fair income, security in the workplace and social protection for families, better prospects for personal development and social integration, freedom for people to express their concerns, organize and participate in the decisions that affect their lives, and equality of opportunity and treatment for all women and men. I don't think any of us really could argue with this as, um, as a goal, as a, an objective. I think it's hugely laudable. And if you think that the, the International Labour Organization is a, a coalition 
which brings together the views of employers, of employees and of governments, that is quite a, a groundbreaking consensus to reach from those three, uh, those three perspectives. Then I'd like to introduce the concept of sustainable human resource management, which um, Ina Ernet, now Ina Aust, has and her colleagues have proposed. The adoption of human resource management strategies and practices that enable the achievement of financial, social and ecological goals with an impact inside and outside of their organisation and over a long term time horizon. So it's this long term perspective, the test match as, a, as opposed to the IPL um, that is important here. Um, so sustainable human resource management covers long term conceptual and practical approaches and activities aimed at socially responsible and economically appropriate human resource management, human resource development. Sustainable HRM can be used for organizational planning and change and sustainable human resource management can help in sustaining employee dignity, particularly in times of in difficult times like like we're facing um, today. So it's an ethical approach to employment. It's recognized. It's, it's something which I would say corporations should be um, including as a priority within their corporate social responsibility commitments in the same way as they they address environmental and wider social issues as well. Um, so again, another definition, those long term, it, it's again, this long term orientation um, aimed at socially responsible and economically appropriate recruitment, selection, development, deployment and release of employees. It's basically taking a socially responsible perspective to all the dimensions of human resource development that companies routinely invest in, but ne not necessarily with the employee in mind, rather with the organisation in mind. And there are different ways of representing it. This is one um, one model that, that that we can find that recognises that, if you like, puts the individual at the centre of the process rather than necessarily putting organisational needs at the centre. I would say there is a need for balance. There's a need for, for a two way conversation between what is important for employees, what's employ, important for employers. And travel and tourism has been more inclined to focus, I would say, on, on organisational rather than individual um, needs historically. Um, so sustainable human, human resource management generally focuses on rights and responsibilities of the individual putting in place practices that get the best out of employees over time, treats them with dignity, that's an important word, decent work, dignity, and encourages them to stay but go further, to, to evolve and develop. Developing mutually beneficial and regenerative relationships between internal and external resource providers, employees, their families, their communities, education systems, universities like your own, um, and the natural environment. So there's a complex interaction there that we're, we are looking at. Um, so the key concepts, again, going back to um, Ina Ernet's um, original point, and if you look at that agenda, and I hope these the, my slides which, um, can be shared with all participants after this event. Um, if you look at that, uh, that list, there's nothing there which a good employer shouldn't be doing in any case. Um, calling it sustainable, in a sense, is giving it something, giving it a prominence, which really, as I say, good employers, effective employers should be doing um, um, as part of their normal work. In practice, what this means is recruitment and selection with a clear eye to the future and to a long-term relationship. And you'd hope um, 
talking to the student community listening in today, you'd hope that when you go for your jobs, when you graduate, that will be very much the uh, the attitude of the employers you're talking to. And it maybe should be a criteria um, that you use in selecting which companies to work with. Training to support the needs of both the individual and the business. So it's training and development is not just about what the organization needs now. It's about what is important to building that long term relationship. Recognition of the wider life, social, family balance, if you like. Recognizing that each of us um, exist outside of the workplace as well as within the workplace. We have dual lives, if you like, and work is only part of it. And I think employers are often often let themselves down by not actually recognizing the talents and the skills and the wider community roles that people play. We tend to identify very strongly with um, with our work situation. And in, in many cases, people have a much richer life outside of work than they do inside. And that should be, I think, recognized as part of this balance process. Designing a safe and supportive workforce. The tourism industry does not have a very good record in terms of its health and safety um, um, adherence. Close working relationships with external uh, stakeholders between the industry and colleges, universities, other stakeholders there, community groups minority community leaderships, trade unions. I think there's a whole complex set of relationships there. And the promotion of diversity as an asset. Um, diversity is by some theorists is seen as a problem if you have a diverse workforce against whatever criteria, whether it's nationality, whether it's linguistic, whether it's gender based, um, whether it's age based, the, um, travel and tourism industry historically seems to have a bias against older workers, for example. Um, but diversity, um, di different ways of thinking, different ways of framing responses to situations are a huge resource benefit to organisations, which they often don't recognise. They always they tend to want people to think in a monochrome, a single single way. Um, this is the orthodox way that we think in this company. No, we should be encouraging people to um, to think more more widely. Um, so all the things I talked about earlier um, are in a sense in, um, indicators of unsustainable practice in, in our industry. Low skills, low productivity, open entry routes in and out. It's very easy in many countries to go into the tourism industry, to leave it, to to see it as, as a, a temporary relationship rather than a long term commitment. Uncompetitive pay in the UK, for example, the, 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 the hospitality industry specifically um, has the lowest average salary of all sectors across um, across the economy. Um, challenging working conditions and some of those are unavoidable. We're in, the, in our industry, we work when others play. That's the reality. Weekends, vacation periods, um, high labour turnover. And that's one where um, which the industry has, as, 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 as long as I've been involved in it, has looked to, 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 to challenge and has not really come up with any records, may, um, any uh, remedies. Maybe we need to accept it. That's the reality. A poor diversity record. Um, gender is a, is a very good example. Women make up, in fact, um, well over half of the workforce and up to 70 percent in some in some areas, but less than 40 percent of all managerial positions are held by women. Less than 20 percent of general management positions are held by women and um, and when, when we look at board um, corporate boards, five to eight percent of board members are women. women. For me, that is a, a, a catastrophic failure to recognize talent. It's a fund. It, 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 it is societal. It is cultural. 
it's replicated in other sectors as well. But it is a huge indictment to our industry that we're we're allowing such talent to be wasted um, in 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 a way that hasn't significantly. It's changed marginally, but it hasn't significantly changed in as long as I've been looking at the area. So where does the global pandemic leave us? Um, last year, um, at the er and during the early phases of the pandemic in 2020, with some colleagues, we 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 looked at the impact on on hospitality, and I recognise this is wider in the travel tourism industry. Um, we looked at the the impact of the, the pandemic on the, the hospitality sector and asked the question of whether this was a new crisis or whether it was an amplification of the norm. And the conclusions we reached were that most of the things that have that happened to the workforce in terms of retrenchment, in terms of reduced hours, um, reduced pay, etc., very vulnerable, um, um, very short, short term decisions about their future. A lot of that was actually an amplification. It wasn't anything new. It's what the ind was the industry norm in times of crises. And the sort of um, the, the, I mean, there's no doubt that the the the, the, uh, the pandemic globally has devastated businesses and employment opportunities in our sector. Um, who knows how many job losses um, there have been, how many will not return. Yet at the same time, the paradox, as our industry say in this country and in, in, in countries like Australia, starts to get back on its feet. The paradox is we now have huge job shortages. So what's happened, and which I don't think anybody actually anticipated, was that people were retrenched, they lost their jobs in, in, in our industry and now won't go back. They've found other opportunities, they've decided that they're going to make their lives working in different areas. So the industry is facing an unexpected crisis in terms of finding a workforce. In many countries, the sector has faced um, stop-start challenges. The industry is opened by government, it's closed by government, it's opened, it's closed, and we've certainly seen that. And that's certainly a huge challenge to sustainable human resource management. The character of those um, uh, of travel where it does exist has changed. Most international travel, for example, has, has closed down. Um, I can't come to India, you at the moment, would find it relatively difficult to come to the UK as a as a tourist, um, and it's um, and, and and that's a huge problem. Um, the vulnerable have been most the most affected: women, youth, um, students, disabled, minorities, migrant workers, informal economy workers. Um, what um, in in academic terms, what COVID nineteen has done is to expose the intersection of disadvantage and exclusion that exists in relation to employment, human resource management in our industry. As I said earlier, we've seen accelerated technology substitution, taking people out of tourism work, less jobs, less opportunity. But is that a win for, for decent work? Are we seeing the elimination of some jobs which people really shouldn't actually be facing, be, be doing? Um, again, I reflected on that in a piece which you can find in the Strathclyde Business School blog section, um, asking what will the new normal be for our industry in terms of employment? Um, so what do we need to do? I think there is a real need for, uh, for government and for other agencies to, um, to address this, to, um, uh, to, to, to work in coalition with um, with other agencies through public agencies here here i've given examples from canada um, the need to to collaborate and to work together at the end of the day though i i started and i'm going to i'm going to finish with this um i think what we need is a vision we need to have some sort of target to which collectively the tourism community whether we are 
whether we are we, we work in the industry, whether we are employers, whether we're business owners, whether we're governments responsible tourism, for tourism, we have to have some sort of uh, a vision. We have to have a, an idea of where we want the industry to be in terms of its employment commitment um, going forward. And before the pandemic, um, I had the opportunity to write a bit about um, about this vision to what what's called rather than forecasting the future um, um, we backcast it we looked we looked if you like we jumped ahead to 2050 and we said this is where we want to be and backcasting is an interesting um, methodology for uh, as an alternative to the limitations of forecasting um, is worth looking at as a thing. And, and, and the, the dream we came up with is that tourism and its value chains, all the multitude of businesses that are involved with the tourism industry, meet the highest ethical standards with respect to work and employment in all sectors and levels within the industry, the multiple levels, formal, informal, etc. Um, respecting the rights and dignity of each individual worker and offering them opportunities to gain just reward for their efforts and to grow and progress irrespective of gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age or disability. And I still stand by that. I think that is a it's a laudable vision. It's a huge challenge. Um, but and it's uh, but it's it's. For me, it's something that's worthwhile fighting for. It's worthwhile aspiring to, because if we could achieve this, so much of the current of the of the current problems and issues that we face would um, would be reduced, would be of less significance. So I'm going to stop here, and I'm very well, would very much welcome discussion with you. Um, and the opportunity to um, to engage in um, a few minutes interaction with 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 my audience in relation to these thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for the very insightful and engaging presentation. Uh, you have discussed the prospects and challenges related to travel and tourism jobs. You have introduced uh, to the students the basic concept and components of sustainable HRM, the indicators of unsustainable HRM, post-pandemic challenges awaiting the existing and potential employees in the travel and tourism sector. And so you have uh, provided us with a very crisp overview regarding what needs to be done to address the COVID-19 induced devastation to the travel and tourism workforce. As uh, rightly explained by you, traditionally everyone has been looking for quick fixes due to lack of vision, both from academy and industrial perspectives, and problems have not really been attempted to be understood from a holistic perspective and only managerial and operational fixes have been attempted. You have uh, given us examples that we could very easily relate to and uh, how despite suffering from the prevailing credibility issues, high attrition rates, the travel and tourism sector provides opportunity to multiple talents, interests and circumstances, uh, which I believe our students who are attending this seminar would uh, really find motivating. So, sir, uh, in uh, 2020, uh, the Indian tourism sector accounted for around 31.8 million jobs, which was 7.3 percent of the total employment in the country and uh, according to the recent statistics it is projected that by 2029 it is expected to account for about 53 million jobs in india and our government has also recently realized the country's potential as a tourism hub and are taking several steps to make india a global tourism hub so in such a uh, situation, in such a scenario, one of our major focus as teachers and trainers of travel and tourism would always be on bridging the gap between trained workforce requirements and the human resource avail availability in the travel and tourism industry. So, sir, our first question from the end of the audience is, how uh, is the nature of work in hospitality and tourism unique 
in comparison to other fields? That is a very, very, very good question. Um, and with, as with all sort of questions in this area, um, my immediate response is to say that yes, the context is unique, but in other respects, no, it is not unique. It is work. Um, and it's, a, it's an area of interest, very, very interesting debate. Um, as, a, um, as you rightly said earlier on, I've been working in this field for a long time. And one of the, the constant themes has been the, the if you like, debates in, in terms of education and training has been as to whether the education and training should be generic, should be should treat, should teach um, generic transferable skills in the business area, in the workplace areas, or should be very, very much focused on specific technical outcomes. Now, early education and training in our field was very much specific. You were trained for a job. And I remember, for example, um, 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 back, back in the 1970s, 1980s, that the, um, the organizations like the International Labour Organization produced manuals which specified exactly what each of the jobs within our industry should comprise and that anybody who was going to be trained to be a waiter, to be, to be, to be a, um, an airline booking clerk or whatever, would have to have this body of knowledge and this set of skills. Um, since then, we've moved to a situation where we recognize that, yes, there are technical requirements for jobs and, and clearly in, 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 say, the culinary area, that those are very important. But for most jobs in our industry, it is the it is the generic um, competencies. It's the human qualities. It's the communication qualities. It's the com it's the um, technological qualities that we need. The job specific skills are relatively easy to train. And of course, it's much easier to train somebody to do the, some of the technical jobs that we do in our industry now than it was in the past. Technology has taken care of that. And that's evidenced. I mean, again, I've, I've done quite a lot of work in the area of, of hotel reception. And the job of a hotel receptionist used to be hugely technical. You had to, and in, in, in my day, I don't know about in India now, but in my day, people went on two or three year diploma courses to become a hotel receptionist. Nowadays, five star hotels where I am here are recruiting people with no hotel experience, no hotel training, and putting them straight into reception because they have the personality, they have the human skills to, um, to, uh, uh, to cope with that. And the technical requirements of engaging with the the, the, the support packages, the reservations packages or whatever they are, um, is relatively easy because the, it's, it's, it, the, 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 the fields, the environment is common to the world that most of us um, exist in anyway. So to learn to, to the technical side of that, that job is, is, is relatively short, short scale. What used to be three years is now a maximum of three weeks in terms of, of on the job training. So we've seen huge changes there. So I would say that the, the, the specifics from a technical point of view are far more, are far less important than they were. But from a human point of view, they remain very, very important. Um, the ability to engage with people, the, 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 the ability to empathize, to understand what people want from their interaction with um, um, as visitors, as guests, is hugely important. And those those are qualities which not everybody possesses. Not everybody is is suited to a, a front a frontline uh, role. Back office again is a different thing. Back office arguably is not hugely different, whether it's an airline, a travel agency or a hotel, not hugely different from other administrative roles that we might perform in other businesses. So it's difficult. I think 
I find it very difficult to sustain the argument that we offer a unique work work a work and skills environment. I think we have a lot more common than we're we're often willing to to acknowledge, and that's evidenced in the large number of of travel and tourism graduates who migrate into other careers. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what are the skill sets that shall be expected out of students in the future, the ones who are pursuing the travel and tourism courses? So in the future, what skill sets would be expected out of them? I think as I am really following on from the last question, I think um, a lot of the uh, a lot of this is about it will be about your personal qualities, your adaptability. I think if there's anything that the last year and a half, two years have shown us about um, employees in tourism is their need to be hugely personally, but also skills related, adaptable, the ability to adopt the, or the, the, the safety protocols, the health protocols that many businesses now require, but also the ability to switch into other roles. I mean, we've, we've been doing work looking at what happened to the uh, to travel and tourism workers in, in, um, in, in many countries and with the onset of the pandemic. And many of them transitioned into other community focused roles, helping old people, providing um, 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 food services for, um, for the vulnerable, for the, for the homeless, um, working in specialist quarantine facilities, for example, which we're seeing increasingly now with, um, well, um, in relation to travel and tourism, it takes specific skills to be able to, in, to relate to people who are, um, who are um, or quarantining, for example. In, in, in the UK, we've seen quite a few hotels um, transferred to use for as, as homeless hostels for people uh, for people who live on the streets to keep them less vulnerable to the, the ravages of the um, 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 of the virus. And that again has been very important, um, but that requires different skills. So I would say adaptability, flexibility, both in terms of your technical skills attributes, but also psychologically, you need to be, you cannot be fixed. And, I, and, and this is a, a general rule, I think. I think that the, the days when you could sort of sit down at 19 and 20 and say, this is my career, this is my working life, are gone. You've got to be uh, flexible. You've got to be able to look really at 360 degrees around you and see where opportunities and, and, and arise to respond to, to what I would call serendipity, to the unexpected opportunities that are around you. They may take you into in very unexpected directions. And if you are totally focused on one thing, you might find yourself running up against uh, a buffer which um, as technology changes the nature of jobs, the job you want to do may no longer exist. So I think flexibility, mental flexibility, technical flexibility um, in, a, in, 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 in the broadest sense. Thank you so much, sir. There are uh, two more questions that we will take for this session. So what would be some of your suggestions uh, that both uh, government and industry can utilize in order to minimize the negative issues that bog the travel and tourism industry, namely low pay, long working hours, high attrition rates? Ah, that's a lovely question. Um, one of the, um, I've been working with colleagues in a number of countries who have been looking at um, working conditions not only in relation to um, the pandemic, but also linked to the pandemic recently. And colleagues of mine have produced um, reports which challenge the industry in many ways to, to address the um, um, work-related issues. And what has been particularly depressing in this part of the world has been collective denial by employers and employer groups that, um, that these conditions exist, arguing that, well, we're not talking about the general, we're talking about specific bad 
apples, if you like, rather than um, than the general. So I think um, for me, the biggest challenge is really getting um, persuading the industry and maybe government play a role uh, with uh, in, in, in that di discussion to accept greater responsibility here, to accept, as I said earlier, that employment, good working conditions are part of your corporate social responsibility. After all, as a, an employer, you live within a community, you have a responsibility to that community, not just to pay the, 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 the lowest possible wage you can, but to actually contribute, give something back to that community um, um, through good working conditions. Here in Scotland, we have, and my colleagues in my department um, are leading on this, we have what's called the Fair Wage, um, a Fair Work Convention, and you can find it online. And it set states, both in relation to pay, but in terms of general working conditions, um, it's, um, it set states a number of principles which employers can sign up to, and a large number of employers do operate under the Fair, Way, uh, Fair Work Convention here in Scotland. Um, a lot don't as well, and that's, uh, and that's going to be a problem. For me, the most important thing that, that can happen is for, um, for employers to give what I would call, give, em give employees greater responsibility for their own lives, give them great, a greater role in shaping their working lives alongside their other lives. Uh, giving them what's what academics would call agency, greater agency in terms of, of their lives and working with that. So listening to what employers want for employees want from work and creating a workplace that is designed around them rather than demanding, always demanding that employees fit in with the rules of the house. And that's a huge shift. So I think governments can do a certain amount to encourage this, um, but ultimately it's, it's, a, it's, it's a wider social attitude to work and to, um, and, and, and to, to workers that's required. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for patiently answering the questions. Uh, due to time constraints, uh, we cannot take any more questions. Now, may I request uh, our head of the institute, Professor Siddharth Nanda, sir, to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. On behalf of Amity School of Travel and Tourism, the points that you have shared, talking about the challenges that uh, human resource are facing, the, uh, the different skill sets that is required, the pay wages, every aspect that you have discussed is truly very important and it's bound to change in future. And I really appreciate, sir, the point that you have shared that the students need to upgrade themselves with the requirement, need to be more, more upgraded relating to the technology. They have to be more equipped skillfully uh, relating to different industries. They have to open, they have to change their attitude, which is true. And we hope we had more time with you, sir, so that we could, uh, no, you could address more. It was a beautiful session. And I would request, Professor Vandita, if participants have more questions, uh, we can just mail it across to sir so that you know he can also go through it once. And it was really an interesting and eye-opening session for all of sir, for all of us. Thank you so much once again, sir, for addressing today's session. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. My pleasure, and I'll be delighted to hear from Thank you. Um, any of the participants at any point. Thank you.